If you're like me and around 25 years old, you probably remember the time from the mid-2000s to the early 2010s when vampires were pretty much the lamest horror villain there was. And in my biased 10-year-old child mindset, I entirely blame this franchise. Twilight took the concept of immortal, blood-sucking monsters and made them glitter in the sunlight. Thank you, Stephanie Meyer. Very awful. But as of late, I feel like both myself and others have come around to vampires again. They're starting to feel, if not scary, then at the very least interesting once more. And I think there's two main reasons for that. One is this guy. Thank you, Dio Brando. Every time he's on screen, it's a fun time, and he made being a vampire menacing again. Hard not to be threatening when you can shoot lasers out of your eye and stop time. And the other thing that's bringing him back, and far more relevant to this video, is Warhammer. Warhammer took a somewhat different approach to vampires. Instead of being these flamboyant, insane beings bent on world domination, they're just in charge of pretty much every other supernatural being in the world. Yeah, they're also flamboyant, insane, and bent on world domination, but they're also the ones ordering all the other spooky creatures around. Ghost hauntings, skeletons rising from their crypts, and the zombie apocalypse all happen at the word of the vampires in Warhammer. And while in the Age of Sigmar they're not quite as in charge of all these people as they were before, they're still important figures who can individually have thousands if not millions of others under their control. Granted, most of those millions are mindless zombies and skeletons, but that's still pretty impressive. So continuing on my trend of 2024 videos, let's embrace the sweet release of death. Do you hate the sun? Are you a parasite subsisting off of others? Does your complexion make people wonder if you aren't a living corpse or not? Well, aside from being the average Warhammer player, the Soulblight Gravelords might just be the army for you. But hold the phone for just a moment. Warhammer, spoiler alert, can be a bit expensive. And money, believe it or not, is not something most people have an unlimited supply of. Some people may even have some debt racked up, in which case you cannot buy more plastic army dudes. Which is why this video is sponsored by PDS Debt. PDS Debt provides options to consolidate your debts into one low monthly payment. Have you gotten yourself crippling debt over your non-stop purchases of things like plastic army men, VTuber merchandise, and life's other necessities? Well, PDS is here to help. They're highly rated on Google and have an A-plus rating on the Better Business Bureau. And if you have 10000 or more in debt, you're eligible. You can save thousands on interest and fees. It could be from credit card debt, medical debt, whatever kind of debt you can think of. PDS Debt can help you get rid of all of it. And how to get started is very simple. Just use my link in the description to head on over to pdsdebt.com slash pancreas for a free debt analysis. It only takes 30 seconds to get yourself a free debt analysis, and you can start working on getting rid of any debt you may have. If you have any problems with debt you feel you can't get out of, PDS Debt is here to help. Now then, let's do the Monster Mash. The Soulblight Gravelords are the vampiric faction of Warhammer Age of Sigmar. As with all other factions in Grand Alliance Death, their beginning comes when Nagash was freed from his Gravesand prison by Sigmar in the Age of Myth. The Soulblight Battle Tome is kind enough to shed some light on why Sigmar freed Nagash instead of working with another Death God. If nothing else, Nagash was a known evil, and better the devil you know and all that. Plus, it's implied that Sigmar in these early days was incredibly desperate for allies in this new and unknown world, and Nagash in turn realized that he was just as in the dark as Sigmar was and played along with the God King for the time being. Naturally, he of course planned on betraying Sigmar and everyone else as soon as possible, but at least gives us a reasonable explanation on why Sigmar freed someone who calls himself the Great Necromancer and is as evil as that title would lead you to believe. Pretty much the moment he was freed, one of his first orders of business was to bring back some of the vampires of Warhammer Fantasy to be his lieutenants once again. Neferata, Manfred, and Ushuren were all brought back. Ushuren, for a variety of reasons, is beyond insane and goes off to more or less found the Flesh Eater Courts, though more on that in their video. As for Manfred and Neferata, they began siring more and more vampires across the mortal realms, and soon enough there's thousands of the bloodsuckers as they begin siring their own vampires in turn. The vampires are similar enough to the classic vampire and their incarnation from old fantasy, with a couple of Age of Sigmar touches to make them unique. For one, the name Soulblight Gravelords comes from the Soulblight curse all of them carry within them, AOS's interpretation of the beast within the vampires often have in fiction. It's a monstrous aspect of their souls that turns them into mindless beasts hell-bent on consuming blood, and crucially, it's all but stated to be an inevitability. They can fight it off and cling onto any ideals they may hold, but sooner or later a vampire is going to become a true monster. Aside from being neat, it's also a nice little thing to prevent any worries about GW copyrightifying their names for vampires in the setting. There's still vampires, everyone. No Duarden nonsense here. I also might have jumped the gun a bit on calling them unique, because Vampire the Masquerade exists. But given Warhammer Fantasy came out in the 80s, I'm not entirely
entirely sure who was ripping who off when it came to the whole vampire bloodlines thing, so let's just call it even. The vampires swiftly began creating dynasties to rule over. Manfred and Neferata, of course, are the big head honchos who are so influential they have legions of blood, but there are other important characters in dynasties. The Castelli, Avangorii, Virkos, there's plenty of options to choose from and plenty of vampires plotting their own schemes to conquer the mortal realms. Even in the early days of the Age of Myth, they were pretty antagonistic against pretty much everyone, with Neferata doing her thing and creating a massive network of spies, while Manfred does his thing of being a colossal asshole. His very first act in the lore in AOS is to cause two dwarf clans to fall to ruin in what's known as the War of the Nail. Not much details on what exactly went down, but it's good to know that for everything that changed in AOS, there's still plenty that stayed the same. Of note is that the vampires in AOS are now constantly under the direct influence of Nagash, meaning that unlike in fantasy, they have to be much more discreet with their ambitions. While Nagash is perfectly happy to let them in fight, this only extends so far. Manfred and Neferata go at it all the time, but they have to do so behind the scenes if Nagash is directly marching them towards war, and the same extends to the other vampires. He also isn't much a fan of their independent nature, as despite his rule, they are the most self-sustaining of the death factions. He uses them as generals and accepts that he needs them to be able to think for themselves, and much is the same for the necromancers that make up the Soulblight armies, but he isn't happy about this fact. This has in turn given the vampires both more capacity for independent actions than any other death armies, while at the same time giving them less than any others. They're allowed free reign to perform their tasks as they wish, and any side hustles they might have, but Nagash's attention is constantly on them. Any missteps will see them sent straight to the bone zone for all time. In spite of all the things going for and against them, in the Age of Myth they did help with the construction of civilization. Without the endless undead hordes of the Soul Blight, cities that spanned entire countries worth of land would never have been constructed as quickly as they were. Nagash didn't really care for direct rulership over his subjects, largely leaving that up to the Soul Blight, who in turn also didn't give a damn beyond using the living as cattle. This resulted in the realm of Shyish being academically known as a complete shithole, and more colloquially known as Fantasy Chicago. So when the Age of Chaos hit, it was both especially brutal, but also not too terrible for the Soul Blight and Death as a whole. Nagash's rule sucked so hard that plenty of people saw worshipping Chaos as better even if they weren't insane. Obviously, this is complete and utter heresy, as Nagash is truly the rightful ruler of the mortal realms, but without the view we as the readers get of the lore, it's somewhat understandable those within it were not fully aware of Nagash's brilliance. This led to massive swaths of Shyish territory being taken over by Chaos forces, with both the afterlives within it and the areas with actual living inhabitants being subsumed by Chaos. On the one hand, it was a whole lot of ground lost, but on the other hand, material losses mean pretty much nothing to the undead. Oh no, you killed my zombies. Whatever will I do, other than resurrect them and everyone who died trying to kill them? So it was sort of a mixed bag as far as the Age of Chaos goes. Chaos paid Nagash special attention since they hate everything he stands for, but getting rid of death is something that's rather hard to pull off. For a while, he did as all the death factions did and bunkered down. Nagashi's R2.0 was sacked and Nagash himself defeated, Neferata's capital of New Lamia was besieged and she focused on dealing with that, and Manfred started waging guerrilla war across Shyish. When the Stormcast Eternals made their grand debut, the Soulblight began moving in earnest as well. Manfred allied with certain storm hosts and Neferata expanded her network of spies, and undead legions for the first time in ages pushed back the forces of chaos. Of course, with Sigmar's pantheon disbanded, the undead fought the living as often as they did chaos. Storm hosts as often as not were under attack by the Soulblight, and as time went on and chaos was pushed back more and more, the living soon learned that the dead were not here to liberate them. Of course, Nagash wasn't content with this, and soon his latest great ritual would begin. Bringing all the grave sand he could to the center of Shia, she started building his latest magical pyramid to drown all of reality and death magic with. Obviously, it doesn't work because the Skaven still exists, but it did still flood reality with death magic, instead of the intended effect of flooding reality with death magic and also killing everyone. It also created a magical black hole of death magic known as the Shyish Nadir, which he could temporarily enter to supercharge himself. The funny thing about it is that it's just kind of hanging around in Shyish at the center of the realm. Obviously, it's going to be defended, but assuming you had the clearance or ability, you could just walk up to the thing, and regardless of that, it's safe to assume it's huge. So if you happen to be wandering Shyish and look to the skies, you can see the end of all creation. Because this was when the Nighthaunt and Oziark Bone Reapers were getting their time to shine, the Soulblight weren't super active in comparison around this time. That said, it did sort of drive the vampires into a frenzy of conquest as the uptick of death magic empowered them and allowed them to sate their hunger like never before. 
Both under Nagash's orders and of their own volition did the Soul Blights strike out across the mortal realms, their own necromantic powers swelled by the Necroquake. Nagash ordered Manfred and Neferata to attack the various realm gates in an attempt to connect them to the Shaiish Nadir and drag the various mortal realms into it, potentially fulfilling his ultimate plan even though it misfired. And in turn, when Teclis and Alariel defeated Nagash and ended the Necroquake, they were the least affected. The independent nature of the vampires allowed them to continue on rather than dissipating like the Night Haunt did. Now at Nagash Nagash's body broken and stuck as a spirit in Nagash's czar, they had a chance like never before to enact their own schemes unpunished. Manfred and Neferata both had contingencies planned in case their attacks failed, with Manfred outright setting up his own attack to fail. Given that his target was a Lariel in the realm of life, which is inherently a counter to death, he probably didn't have to try very hard. With Nagash out of the picture, Manfred immediately went to war with Neferata and annexed much of her territory, which only ended when the Heir of the Beast caused the various armies of Grand Alliance destruction to go on a rampage. Faced with millions of ogres at their doorstep, even the vampires decided it would probably be best to cut out on the infighting for just a bit. The various dynasties and necromancers of the Soulblight have begun looking for ways to free themselves in Agash's rulership, as now that he is bound to his capital city as a spirit, he can no longer directly enforce his will. Of course, this is still Warhammer, so not all is perfect for them. In some ways, Nagash is just as powerful as ever, and even more so, arguably. He can temporarily project avatars of himself across reality, and he can spy on any of his forces with near impunity. He can also enter the Shaiish Nadir for longer than he ever could with his physical body, empowering him even further. As he checks in on the various vampires and their loyalty towards him, when he finally has a proper body again, it seems he's gonna have his own naughty and nice list with the Soulblight dynasties. Those who were too brazen in their attempts to break free may find that their fate was sealed the moment Nagash returns. To make matters worse, Alariel's life magic ritual also empowered beast magic, leading to the era of the beast as mentioned before. This has caused many of the vampires to absolutely lose their shit. Particularly hard hit were the Avangorii and the Virkos dynasties, who each embraced the Soulblight curse in their own way. Beast magic spreading across reality has threatened to overwhelm them each. The Avangorii believe that the beast within them is something they've allied with, but are finding out that truly embracing it robs them of what little sanity they have. The Virkos, meanwhile, are going for a more animalistic nobility sort of vibe, and the air of the beast in turn is changing them from somewhat noble creatures akin to wolf packs into something closer to God's rabidest pit bull in a child daycare. But even with all this, they're still the most coherent death power in my eyes. While the Osiarch's staunch discipline means they're still following Nagash's will, Teclis, Solariel, and the forces of chaos have done a number on them. The Nighthawn have lost much of their power now that the death magic across reality has lessened, and the Flesh Eater courts never really struck me as the sort of fellows with a grand plan either way. They just sort of happen to be in an area one day and start lowering property values. While weakened from both within and without, however, the Soulblight Gravelords still march across reality with undead hordes numbering in the millions, inflating their numbers with refugees now that death magic is being countered and growing ever stronger in their necromantic knowledge. And you, dear listener, might be just the thing they need to claim not only victory over the mortal realms, but independence from Nagash's undying grip. Let's get into their positives. For lore positives, the Soulblight Gravelords are vampires once again taking their spot as the coolest horror monster around. They are at the head of armies of thousands upon thousands of living dead, besieging cities and bringing terror to the mortal realms. Vampires, at least to me, seem to be uniquely feared amongst the mortal of AOS. They're of course a massive threat to order, but unlike chaos or destruction, you won't always know that they're gunning for you. There are these barely seen shadows in the night that can become very real at a moment's notice. So if you've always had an interest in gothic horror villains but have been disillusioned by Twilight and the like, this is your time to get back in the game of vampirism. They're also for you if you've got a penchant for nobility with your favorite factions, which is something that feels a lot more prevalent in the fantasy settings of Warhammer compared to 40k. Rogue traders exist, sure, but they're not exactly a fleshed out roster on the tabletop, and they tend to do their own thing, which is kind of unfortunate because they're interesting characters. By contrast, the vampires in AOS are almost all aristocrats in some way or another, and do have an actual army. They style themselves as nobility amongst the peasantry, only in this case the peasants are everyone who isn't a vampire. It gives them a certain class, one that's very intentionally engineered by them to appear as more than bloodthirsty beasts. It's a rather elegant thing, so if you want your army to be led by the bluest of bloods, then hey, hard to go wrong here. It's an entertaining image, isn't it? And ironic and hypocritical, but that's part of the fun. Some vampire in a posh accent dismissing the rampaging hordes of orcs at his doorstep as something utterly gauche and so out of season while he summons thousands of lurching corpses to deal with them. And while they are evil, they're a fair bit more fleshed out than just, we are all evil, bow before us. Not that there's an issue with that, Nagash is just that, and I firmly support him in his endeavors. But the vampires in AOS have at least a bit more than that going for them. For one, they all realize they can't just kill everyone like Nagash wants. They need blood 
to survive, and killing everything ever means dooming them to starvation. Instead, they prefer to subjugate the living and use them as cattle. Not exactly a mercy, and it's entirely born out of pragmatism, but you'd be alive and sane under their rule, so it's better than what some other factions are offering. And with that, AOS has room for all sorts of vampiric characters. There's the big Bloodlines themes you can follow, of course, such as the Castellite Dynasty being Blood Knights 2.0 and only seeking out worthy foes and all that. But since AOS gives you free reign to do whatever you want with your army's lore, you can have vampires that genuinely care for their living compatriots, or at least recognize it's easier to rule over content peasants than it is to rule over ones who hate you. It's gonna be hard to not be evil with the Soulblight Gravelords, but having your army be pragmatically evil by necessity at worst is a possibility. They're also one of the most numerous factions, and perhaps the only one in existence with the potential to outnumber the Skaven. This is because the requirements for an army are having mostly intact corpses nearby. And you can really stretch the definition of mostly. A skeleton or one missing a few of its limbs will do. If they're facing someone like the Skaven, they can beat even them in attrition, because every Skaven killed is another potential zombie to fight. Same goes for almost every other faction, even if there's no zombie, skaven, or ogre models without some kitbashing and creative paint jobs. You will never run out of soldiers in your army. You are never in danger of your faction being wiped out in the lore. And while numerically there's less vampires than any other race in the setting, there are still untold thousands of them out there, and they're hard to find. Neferata and Manfred have had thousands of years to sire all the vampires they need, who in turn have gone on to do the same thing. So sure, there's less vampires than anyone else, but there's still a lot. This is helped further by the fact that every character in your faction is incredibly powerful. Even the weakest vampire is a powerhouse of death magic, and their brute strength is enough to tear apart a knight with their bare hands. Necromancers, meanwhile, may not be great in melee, but they can decide that now you have to face not only them, but 20 of their newly resurrected best friends as well. Killing a zombie or a skeleton in Warhammer might not be hard, but killing the person making them, however, is very hard. This faction's not going to be going anywhere, and everywhere you look in the mortal realms, you can never be 100% certain that things that go bump in the night aren't just around the corner. In fact, this army is one of those special armies where losing can still be a positive result of a battle. Let's say an army of fire slayers fights an army of soulblight gravelords. The vampire leading them fails to achieve a his objective, but ultimately escapes, in the process losing his entire army. For him, this is a minor setback that really just lost him some time and whatever effort it takes to raise those corpses back up. In turn, the Fire Slayers have lost a good chunk of their forces and will be all that much weaker when the Vampire Lord comes back for round two. Fire Slayers don't replenish their losses nearly as quickly as he does, after all, since in Warhammer, death is magic. All the Vampire needs to do is say Abracadavra and he has a whole new army. Just grab some more grave sand, refine it into shade glass, and he's suddenly leading the largest and most powerful army in the region. To say nothing of the fact that if you're running Manfred in your army, losing the battle will still bring you some small amount of joy, because Manfred just got his head caved in. And in my favorite lore positive, they're a faction that marries being a continuation of Warhammer fantasy lore while also having plenty of unique Age of Sigmar stuff. Obviously, there's the big name characters for Old World stuff. Manfred is still kicking despite everyone's best efforts, Neferata has her web of spies once again spanning reality, and Nagash continues to do his best to rule all of reality. But there's plenty of new compelling characters as well. There's Radikur of the Virkos Dynasty, who actually has two different models for different points in his life, the wolf for when he's mostly still humanoid, and the beast for when he's more wolf than man. Which also, werewolf vampire. Hell yeah. There's Kato Ezekiel, the Hollow King, who's got quite the baggage attached to him. In the Age of Chaos, he became a vampire as his kingdom fell to chaos around him, and now seeks not only to take vengeance against chaos, but cling to his morality, despite the fact he needs to eat people to survive. He's even got a book. There's Laukavai, an Avangoriai vampire trying to cling on to her sanity, even as her body becomes more and more bestial. There's a lot of good stuff in the Soulblight Gravelords for fans of the old and new alike, so if you like having a pretty diverse cast of characters in your force, you can't do much better than this army. And lastly, they're an army that can fit in all scales of battle. For larger scale battles, imagine zombie hordes in the millions as bats blot out the sun and death magic turns the landscape around you into a barren wasteland. On the smaller scale, bands of black knights can face off against garrisons as night falls and the moon rises in the dark. Hell, remember that all vampires are expert death magic casters and necromancers are here to party too. You can flavor your army as being entirely based around stealth if you want. Have your vampire lord be this expert, dishonored level infiltrator sneaking into even the greatest of cities and fortresses on Neferata's behalf or for their own labyrinthine schemes. If things go wrong or it's time to go loud, they resurrect all the corpses they left behind and BAM! Instant undead strike force behind enemy lines. 
Sure, the image of them moving in unstoppable hordes is the first thing that comes to mind with the Soulblight Grave Lords, but there's never a scale of battle they don't fit in. As for their tabletop positives, there's a couple of generalizations to go over first. For one, you have an absurd potential of causing mortal wounds. Even the basic zombie can dish them out either when they die or through other units buffing them. You're also a lot harder to kill than at first glance, between either general hero toughness or any buffs and resurrection tricks you might be able to pull off. Additionally, if you take a quick look through the war scrolls of the various units in the Soulblight army, you'll notice that not a single one of them has a leadership of less than 10. Pretend that Battleshock is not a feature in the Age of Sigmar if you're running this army. It's something that other people have to deal with. Moving on, I'm going to start with their hero units first for these guys, since they're the unbeating heart of your army. And to summarize, they're all great. As a rule of thumb, most of these fellows are going to be spellcasters. A necromancer on paper is a bit of a joke, but his main benefit is that he can cast a spell that lets a unit in range dance on the enemy so hard they get to fight for free. He can also allocate any wounds he takes to nearby friendly units, so he can keep doing this for as long as he has corpses nearby to keep him safe. A White King can buff nearby skeletons or graveguard to get more hits in and can dish out some mortal wounds on a roll of a six. Having five attacks that all hit fairly hard, with a bit of luck he can tear his way through elite units or take down weaker characters in a single turn. You can also put him on a horse, where in exchange for forgetting how to tell skeletons to do better, he gains the ability to let Black Knights have a higher chance at causing mortal wounds when they charge. Vampire Lords can fly, hit hard, take a decent amount of damage to kill, and can cause a unit to have more attacks that turn. They can also regenerate, just in case you thought they were going anywhere. You can also put one on a dragon, just in case your middle finger wasn't raised high enough yet. But that was just generic characters. Neferata, aside from being good at giving nearby units defensive buffs, can kill a character on a 5-up if she wounded them this turn. She's also a wizard. Radikar the Beast is great for deleting anything that comes near him and can run and charge in the same turn, so good luck getting away from him. Laukavai, aside from being good in melee, can buff nearby monstrous units, can fly, and is also a wizard. To keep myself from getting repetitive, if there's a named character in the Soulblight roster, just assume they're either incredible in melee or just good in melee and also a wizard. There's also almost no one in the army with less than five wounds, and usually this is accompanied by a three-up save. Your heroes aren't going anywhere short of either the most brutal attack or a concentrated barrage of firepower, so they can for the most part be relied upon to stay in the fight for a bit. They may be wretched, but they're powerful. Their special units are also wonderful at either buffing, tearing into the enemy, or both. Terrorgeist and zombie dragons are as good at melee as you'd expect, and they even have a nice little ranged attack to boot. Mortis engines can resurrect nearby units as well as damage nearby enemies if a friendly wizard casts some spells near it, and also hit reasonably hard and move pretty damn fast. Coven thrones are wizards, can either cast an extra spell or gain a command point depending on who goes for First in a battle round, and have a spell where if they kill an enemy hero with six total wounds or less, it can give you a free vampire lord. A corpse cart lets zombies cause mortal wounds on sixes if they're nearby, and buffs friendly casting rolls and debuffs enemy casting rolls of nearby wizards. Moving down to what I consider to be their elite units, Black Knights are decent cavalry that can cause mortal wounds on the charge and can cut through weaker units pretty alright. Blood Knights are the same, only better at everything, except a slightly slower move stat of 10 inches rather than 12. Vargeist can rip and tear through most enemies they might face, can heal, and they can deep strike. Did your enemy forget to keep his artillery defended? That's a shame, because it's time for surprise super bats. And Graveguard hit reasonably hard for frontline infantry, and of course can dish out mortal wounds, because of course they can. Now, the meat of the army. Let's take a moment and break the ice on just what we're dealing with. You have a force of undead with numberless legions of zombies and zombified dogs attacking the living. Grave Sand and Shade Glass is a mysterious, magical, and almost certainly somewhat evil substance that can bring the dead back to life in a horrific parody of what they once were. Do either of those things sound familiar? familiar? Sure, the basic zombies of the Soulblight Gravelords can be seen as something from The Walking Dead, but The Walking Dead is itself a shambling corpse that took about seven seasons too many to finally die. So instead, embrace the fact you have endless rotting hordes of maggot sex resurrected by Fantasy Element 115 while undead dogs rush ahead of them to bring the beauty of annihilation to your enemies. And unfortunately for anyone facing you, there is no war scroll for Tank Dempsey. With proper buffing, your zombie hordes can last surprisingly long between resurrecting abilities and any buffs they have. After all the fighting is done, you can also roll a die for every model that they've killed. On a 2-up, you've got a new zombie in that unit, and this can even let you go above the maximum number of zombies in that unit normally allowed. If your opponent is unlucky with their rolls and has an army of chaff, this can very quickly turn into a snowball where one zombie begets two, begets four, begets your enemy suddenly finding himself very outnumbered. Skeletons, while more expensive, generally fare better in melee and can resurrect themselves without needing to kill any enemy units. They also get a bonus to Ren if there's more skeletons and there are models in the unit they're fighting. 
Dire Wolves can cut their enemy chaff reasonably quickly or flank around and get some undefended archers, or just generally can be used to pressure an opponent's flank. And Felbats move fast, can fly, can regenerate, and add one to their attack characteristics if they kill a model. Throw them at a wizard and watch as it disappears in a cloud of shrieking teeth. For some final notes, their magical game is solid. There's not much in the way of caveman brain killing enemy unit spells, but they do have some neat stuff. It's split between the lore of vampires for vampire units and the lore of death mages for necromancers and this dude with the most entertaining name to say I've ever heard. Vampires lets you cause wounds on an enemy unit if they charge, lifesteal from an enemy unit, and cause one mortal wound to either D3 or D6 enemy units depending on the casting roll. Death mages, meanwhile, lets you either subtract the amount of attacks an enemy unit can perform, force an enemy unit to have the strike last effect, or subtract from the wound roll and damage characteristics of an enemy unit. Again, not exactly a whole lot in terms of outright damage, but very good stuff for ensuring your army can bring the hurt once you get into melee. And finally, their stuff all looks real good on the tabletop. Any units of theirs that are left over from Fantasy were the cream of the crop, and their newer units, like the Deadwalker Zombies, have that Age of Sigmar glow up from their old world equivalents. Not really much to say here other than their stuff looks good. I'd recommend painting your vampire lord like he's Dio. Put Radikar the Beast model behind him, also painted yellow, and pretend it's the world. Is this necessary? No, but I feel like I haven't forced a shitty anime joke in my videos in a while, except for the VTuber ones I make, so I felt obligated to do so here now. And before we move on to the lore cons, let me just tickle you right in the nostalgia. There we go. For the lore cons, the Soulblight Gravelords are hovering dangerously close to stupid evil. Now on the whole, they aren't as bad as Manfred, and even Manfred has learned since the end times that you generally don't want to keep fighting your allies while actively being attacked by outside forces. But that said, politicking runs deep through this faction. In Soulblight society, it's almost a social full pod to not stab someone in the back if it would benefit you. To be clear, they're not quite on the level of the Skaven, and to some extent this is arguably on purpose. Ultimate victory under Nagash would mean them starving to death, so until they can free themselves from his grasp, a total victory isn't worthwhile. But sometimes you just gotta think that if they would spend just a little more time working together, maybe they'd have freed themselves by now. They're also the most evil of the death factions in as far as they choose to be evil. The Nighthawn are tortured ghosts, so begrudging them for killing the living seems petty. If my eternal soul was in endless pain for all time, I'd probably have some anger management issues too. And the Flesh Eater Courts live in a constant delusion, so again, kinda hard to blame them for being the worst. They didn't ask for what happened to them, and it's a common thing that if any of them break out of the delusion, they go so mad from the realization of what they've done that they slip right back into it. And the Osiarch Bone Reapers, while the most horrifying interpretation of the IRS yet conceived, at least keep things stable the rest of the time. Bone Tax Day only comes around so often, and they'll keep you safe otherwise. The Soul Blight, meanwhile, actively let their fiefdoms fall to ruin or outside invasion, because any living blood is good in their eyes. You can get the occasional kind one, and certain dynasties are better than others, but the Soul Blight overall struck me as the evilest death faction in the sense of them choosing to do evil, rather than it being somewhat circumstantial or forced on them. Granted, I'd rather live next to one one of them than a ghoul king, but still. Additionally, the ultimate victory scenario for the Grave Lords is perhaps the most difficult one to achieve in Warhammer. Chaos has won in the past, so they can pretty clearly achieve what they want. Destruction just likes to fight and eat, so they're arguably in a constant state of victory. And Order can also arguably count just surviving as some sort of grand victory. And if nothing else, killing everyone else is really all they need to do. Even though the death factions have an endgame that, if not easily achievable, can at least have simple and manageable steps taken towards it. But the Soul Blight not only have to defeat all threats facing them, not only have to ensure the mortals of the mortal realms live in constant subjugation under them, but they also have to free themselves from Nagash's grip on top of not succumbing to the curse they all suffer from. I understand achieving victory in an uphill battle is something to applaud and can be fun to work towards, but there's an uphill battle and then there's Sisyphus rolling the boulder uphill. You will certainly have your work cut out for you with the Soul Blight. Much of the army is also pretty personalityless. Sure, the vampires are oozing personality, even if some of them have a personality you'd like to give a good kick in the jaw, but everyone else falls into two categories. Cowering mortals who go through life afraid that they're about to be used as a human Capri son, or mindless undead who have no thoughts beyond mindlessly shambling and attacking whatever their master tells them to. If you want to be really gritty with the details, you also have things like the Vargeist or Felbats, which are mindless beasts that just want to consume the living. Your average troop is physically incapable of having hopes and dreams, so keep in mind that if you're into the narrative side of things, this faction is entirely carried by its leaders and heroes. 
What did you expect, though? Did you expect the zombies that make up their forces would have much in the way of opinions? Here, let's just ask them. Mr. Deadwalker Zombie, what are your thoughts on the tax policy of Hammerhall? Yeah, see, not exactly the minds of a generation, this lot. And lastly, you are playing a faction nominally led by Manfred von Karstein. Or at least a good chunk of them serve him to some capacity. In fact, given that he and Neferata were the only ones who really did the initial siring of vampires on account of Usharan coming down with a bad case of the crazies, there's a 50-50 shot your vampire lord is descended from Manfred. Fun fact, the Soulblight Gravelord army book tells us that not only did the knowledge of Manfred blowing up the old world make its way into AOS, but Manfred himself will oftentimes claim this very thing, presumably to make himself look scarier. And you know what? I don't know what pisses me off more. That Manfred is trying to claim his pathetic attempt at spiting Vlad by killing Gelt as him bringing the world to its knees, or GW trying to cheekily reference them taking Warhammer Fantasy behind a shed and executing it like a sick dog. I realize if you're watching an AOS video, you probably either got over or never really cared about the destruction of Fantasy, but you gotta admit that comes across as kinda asshole-ish. Like, haha, we blew up a setting thousands of people loved. We're so goofy. Fuck you, Manfred. As for their tabletop cons, it's gonna be a lot shorter than their positives, but no less impactful. Let's get the big one out of the way first. As with almost all undead factions, your heroes are what make and break your army. The reason I spent so long talking about them and sort of breeze through the rest of the army is because proper usage of your heroes is gonna determine how your game goes. If they go down early, you might as well forfeit. They keep your army going, and while they're incredibly powerful, they're also the obvious things your enemy is gonna focus on. Given how they're not only good for the rest of your army, but powerful by themselves, they're also quite expensive, so even ignoring how much they buff your army, losing them without making their point cost back first can be crippling. And while yes, they are powerful, they quite frankly need to be powerful, because without hero units buffing them, your units aren't the best. Now, saying they're bad is perhaps a bit much. Blood Knights are pretty great even without any buffs given to them. But to truly make the most out of your army, it needs guidance from a hero. Adding on to this is the rather tricky situation with their point costs. For what you're paying for them, units in the Soulblight Gravelords might seem a bit overcosted. That's because they're designed with heroes buffing them in mind. Just look at the zombies. 150 points for 20 models isn't the worst, but those models are not by any means good at doing anything beyond soaking up attention. Compare that to clan rits, which are 100 points for 20, if armed with a rusty blade, are more accurate than zombies, and can also regenerate. That's 50 points less for a unit of equal size that does the same job of being chaff that only exists to die, so something more important can do its job. Even taking a necromancer turns them into something far deadlier than their base stat line suggests, but without their heroes, you're paying a lot for a subpar unit. This forces you into having to think pretty heavily about the game before it even begins when you're creating your army. Do you want to focus more points on your heroes or mainline units? Focus too much on heroes and all those buffs they give are meaningless because you just don't have enough units on the board. Focus on regular units and they don't have the buffs they need to win because you didn't bring enough heroes. It's a tricky situation and will only get more complicated when you consider the army the enemy is bringing to the table, to say nothing of changing the scale of game you're playing at. At least personally, I think the Vanguard box they have is phenomenal, but if you're just playing a game between between two Vanguard boxes, you've only got one hero to work with. Reduced point costs in general are only going to make choosing which units you bring that much more important. As much as I've made plenty of COD Zombies references, they're certainly not matching up to those undead. The average Deadwalker Zombie is equivalent to around three or four zombie at most. Nova Ruck Sprinter's here to ruin some poor cities of Sigmar Artilleryman's day. You do have some fast units, and a pretty decent amount of units that can fly as well, but the main force of your army is going to be damn slow, unless you specialize entirely in beasts. You also don't have too many movement abilities to work with. There are some, such as the Castellite Dynasty being able to set up one unit in reserve for every one unit on the board to come in on a board edge later in the game, but overall, you're stuck foot-slogging it. To make matters worse, your ranged game is abysmal. It is an utter joke. The Terrorgeist and Zombie Dragons have their ranged attacks, and the spells can let you cause some damage, but otherwise, you have to get up close to start hurting the enemy. While you may have the save or resurrections to get up close, you still need to get into range as quickly as possible. Taking the units in this army with a ranged attack solely because of their ranged attack is a horrible choice, so you'd best get swinging as soon as you can. And lastly, they are not exactly cheap in terms of actual money. The White King, Necromancer, and Cairnwraith are only 18 bucks, and you can make an army of more expensive units to somewhat alleviate the point cost. The named characters are also good at working with this army on a budget given their point cost, and if nothing else, Nagash is $140 to instantly get you halfway to a 2,000 point army. If you really want the classic experience of vampires leading endless hordes of undead, however, you're gonna be paying for the privilege. The very rough math in my head says it could be worse, but the Soulblight Gravelords also aren't the cheapest army around by a long shot. And there are the basics of the Soulblight Gravelords army. 
Get into melee as quick as you can and show the world that vampires in Warhammer aren't just undead parasites. They're undead parasites that can rip you limb from limb at a moment's notice. Use your heroes right, use your units right, and everything will be alright. Thank you as always to my wonderful channel members. You were the element 115 to my zombies, feeling me to wreak havoc on the living. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Alright, it's gotten to a point where a friend of mine mentioned that, Hey Colin, you keep bringing up COD zombies in videos, so I'm going to make a conscious effort to not do that going forward. That being said, let's clear some stuff up before I take my hiatus from referencing my childhood. 1. Darice is the best map. I'm never going to figure out how to say it right, but I will firmly declare it as the best. 2. The Wunderwaffe is the best wonder weapon. Not only does it just mean wonder weapon, but it is reliable, has high ammo capacity relative to how powerful it is, and it's just fun to use. And three, Zombies was better when it was wacky German science doing wacky German science things, not whatever the hell is happening by Black Ops 4. I will not argue the point with anyone on this because I don't care to have my mind changed. 